yeah people who have lived through the 80s and 90s uh, must be very much aware these were primarily beltec danara uptron keltron amtron they were tv brands which were famous way back in 80s and 90s till around mid 90s we never had any of those uh, japanese giants or korean giants sony lg samsung were not there so we were used to these indian companies or for that matter the other companies uh, which i spoke of companies like blackberry uh, yahoo kodak polaroid we used to hear about these companies but what happened to them well because they didn't adapt to the changes in technology they just finished they were just finished they couldn't survive in fact uh, polaroid and kodak do are surviving but you know the condition of them people who read about uh, the market and various news articles you'll come to know of it so this uh, start off with this beautiful uh, saying by charles darwin within quotes and uh, quote and quote it is not the strongest of the species that survive uh, not the most intelligent that survives but it is one that is most adaptable to change a very relevant point which we made way back uh, somewhere in mid 1800 century so jai hind and good afternoon to all of you i'm uh, group captain anirban banerji as uh, dr nileshwar is here uh, introduce me and today we shall be having a session uh, on the topic managing risk in high technologies uh knowing very well that we have participants from various fields i will keep this topic uh, at a very basic level uh, will proceed more like storytelling without getting into nitty gritties or technicalities so here goes the first slide <clears throat> i'll start off with some classic industry orthodoxies now before i start what do you mean by orthodoxies orthodoxies are certain beliefs traditions which people or companies or organizations have because of inherent organization cultures or various other reasons so people generally like to keep on with their orthodoxies and people generally hate changing even the same will be uh, Uh, will be correct for you and me also because we are so much used to a certain way of life someone asks us to change our lifestyle we will resist it is human tendency to resist it is also an organizational tendency to resist change so orthodoxies are those particular particular sets of beliefs within which these organizations work so here are some classic uh, industry orthodoxies i have got a few from the net this is uh, a sunday age article from 2nd of january 2000 uh, Way back in 1895, you can see Lord Kelvin of the Royal Society. He said, "Heavier than air flying machines are an impossibility." Surprising. Uh, within the next ten years, we had the Wright brothers inventing aircraft. Then uh, Charles Jewell of the U.S. Office of Patents. He said, "Ki everything that can be invented has been invented." Just note what he said. This was in 1899. Everything that can be invented has been invented. Interesting, isn't it? they thought that's the end of technology but they never knew that technology knows no upper limits it's just increases exponentially relentlessly then ken olsen president of digital equipment corporation in 1977 says there is no reason why anyone would want a computer in their home too early to realize the importance of computers and uh, way back in 1997 97 was not that far off this is professor uh, from the american university who said the internet is just a fad just like the hula hoop further ken olsen uh said there is no just a second yeah ken olsen said there is no reason why anyone would want a computer in their home something similar to that last uh, one ken olsen i just covered in the last uh, uh slide also who the hell wants to hear actors talk this was said uh, spoken of in 1927 by warner brothers and warner brothers mind it is one of the biggest players in hollywood But this was the era of the silent movies we remember our own silent movies alamara alamara which was the first indian movie and subsequently uh, we changed over to uh, the movies which had speech in it then there was this uh, company called decca recording which rejected the famous uh, english band called beatles way back in 1962 by saying ki we don't like the sound and guitar music is on its way out see such short sightedness about 
how technology, how the world would progress. Further, 20th Century Fox uh, CEO back in 1946 said, television won't be able to hold on to any market it captures after the first six months. People get tired of staring at a ply box every now and then. Plywood box TVs are the ones we had way back in 80s, those Tecla, Teslas and uh, Danaras and uh, BPLs and so on. Surprisingly, Mr. Bill Gates uh, in 2004, he said two years from now, spam would have been solved. Interesting, isn't it? And today, spam accounts for over 90% of all the emails that are sent. The Americans have the need of telephone, but we do not. We have plenty of messenger voice. This was way back in 1876 when Sir William Priest, uh, chairman come managing director of the British Post Office, said he was so convinced with letter writing and telegraphy, he never thought there would be a requirement of uh, sending a message using telephones and so on. On the similar lines, Western Union money transfer also said the telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. Interesting, isn't it? All of them are. So what is the one thing that is common in all this industry orthodoxies? Most important, all these people who made these statements never understood or never had the uh, idea that technology would progress at such a fast rate. It would increase like anything and would in, uh, involve the entire world. So coming to what is technology? Technology, a typical definition is technology is the use of scientific knowledge for practical purposes or applications, whether in industry or in our everyday lives. We use technology everywhere. People, we see so much of uh, technologically advanced gadgets in our home itself, starting from the mobile phone to the laptop, to the microwaves and induction plates or the chimneys we use. Everything, every product has been uh, has evolved from some form of technological R&D that has happened or is happening every now and then. Uh, going back to history, it comes, uh, this word technology comes from the Greek word technologia, uh, which means the systematic treatment of an art or craft. The first part, techni, means the art of skill. And the second part, logia, means the science or the study. So technologia, in effect, means the science or study of means of art or skill. Uh, here is a classical definition given by none other than uh, Professor Tarek Khalil. Uh, all of them, uh, all of you who have been uh, privy to this subject called MOT or management of technology or technology management uh, knows Professor Khalil. He is one of the stalwarts. Uh, technology management is a very upcoming field. Uh, especially in the Western countries and India. In India, we are slowly adapting this new subject. So, uh, Professor Tarek, he said ki, all the knowledge, products, processes, tools, methods, and systems employed in the creation of goods or in providing services constitute what is uh, technology. So, if you look at the growth of technology, I'm sure you would have covered a few in your last session. However, I would like to uh, start my session giving you a little background about how technology evolved. So this is a typical graph of inventions versus uh, the time period. If you see, we started off uh, with the Stone Age, maybe 10,000 years or one lakh years back or so. This gave way to the industrial age, uh, to the agricultural age, further to the industrial age, and the present day we are in the information technology age or the information age. If you see the curve, it was more or less parallel to the timeline till somewhere uh, uh, close to the industrial age. And after that, there has been an exponential growth. It is almost going up very straight. So that shows the way technology has peaked, uh, picked up over the period and how people have been involved in it. Speaking of technology, technology has also resulted in certain, uh, in a term called industrial revolution. Industrial revolutions are basically how this industry evolved over the past 100 or 200 odd years. We generally know it as the first industrial revolution, the second, the third, and the fourth. The first industrial revolution happened uh, somewhere between the late 18th century and the early 19th century, wherein uh, the world saw the use of steam power for the first time. There were weaving looms, mechanizations which happened, and this gave 
uh, way to the second industrial revolution, which happened somewhere late in the 19th century and mid 20th century. So this was the uh, era wherein, with the advent of commercial electricity, uh, we saw mass production lines of uh, various kinds of industries throughout the world. I'll give you an example in the next or next next slide. The third industrial revolution happened somewhere uh, in the second half of the 20th century, 1960s, 70s, 80s. That was the age of automation. We saw the birth of various electronic products, the microchips, the semiconductors, and various IT related things, the information technologies. And this gave rise uh, to the first of the automation efforts. We saw the first of the flexible manufacturing systems and automation systems used in various places, including homes. This new term called Industry 4.0, this was coined uh, somewhere in 2012 in Germany. Uh, this is actually the fourth industrial revolution, also uh, known as the robotization of the century. It's early 2000, 21st century, as I said, 2012. So this was a time where the automation level increased to a new level altogether. It reached a certain higher level, wherein we saw cyber physical systems uh, being the order of the day. Now, what are cyber physical systems? You have a lot of your equipment, a lot of your machineries. If all of them are connected, through a system of, uh, say, internet uh, or using the IoT or the Internet of Things, we get a beautifully enclosed system wherein everything is interconnected with each other. So the cyber meets the physical. So And this results in a cyber physical systems. Networks, clouds, all these have led to a cyber physical uh, system. And this is what is the industry 4.0 or the industrial revolution. Well, this is a slide uh, which I could get it from the net. It tells about the tool, tools of progress. Uh, I don't know whether you're able to see it, read it or not. But primarily, the first figure in this, it shows the first steam power uh, railway coach. Uh, it's interesting to look at it. Just see the few passengers who were mighty thrilled. It's of course, scared also. It's, it was a new thing, first time on rails. And there are a few American soldiers using a steam engine, a steam generating boiler, uh, the shape of which was like this. Then there came the coal mines and the coal factories, the steel factories, the oil mills. Uh, somewhere in 1763, the famous uh, James Watt, who was the inventor of the steam engine, further refined the steam engine and used it in boilers for producing power. And uh, we also had. Uh, Samuel Morse, who was the inventor of uh, the Morse code, which we use till date in certain areas of the military. Otherwise, we used it uh, till around two decades back while sending telegraphs. Many of you must be knowing this. Uh, this is a beautiful collage, collage showing the early development of uh, the industries. And this was uh, what I was speaking to you about two slides back. Mass customization and uh, the second industrial uh, revolution which had. It's a beautiful little story which I'll tell you, maybe around a minute or so. Somewhere after the, immediately after the World War I, uh, there were a number of car, com uh, car companies in the US. There was Chrysler, there was Dodge, there was Ford, of course, uh, there was uh, uh, Daimler-Benz, many others. But the world never had a mass-produced car. This was the time when Sir Henry Ford realized if this is an opportunity, maybe a risk, but it is an opportunity. We must produce cars in huge numbers so that people, whoever are able to pay or who have some amount of money in their pockets are able to use this. And thus started. And his vision was an excellent example of the ultimate uh, vertical integration. He, what he did was uh, he bought a coal mine which was very near to a uh, steel and iron and steel mine. Along this, so what happened? He used to get coals from uh, uh, his mine, the steel from there. So coal used to power up his power plant as well as the steel foundry, which we had. And after that, the steel uh, sheets used to roll out, which he used in his factory to produce cars. So can you imagine a line which starts off with a coal mine and ends with uh, cars being rolled out in numbers? This was the Model T. It's a very famous uh, example. And all ancillary products he started manufacturing, be it the tires, be it the wheels, or the steerings, or the assembly. Everything was within one huge factory. 
Of course, it didn't last really long, but somehow this was a beautiful example of vertical integration. Uh, most of us know about the basic human needs. Uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we all have studied in our colleges, management institutes, uh, wherever you have. So, manage, so basic human needs includes the basic psych, uh, physiological needs, which is, uh, as we call in uh, Hindi, roti kapda makan, the safety, security, social needs, esteem needs, creativity. But along with it, what technology has given us is it has added one base layer that is internet. And this is precisely what we are using today when I'm delivering this uh, talk to you. So this has become an essential human necessity nowadays. Right from the 18th century, technology uh, in various areas have been evolving at a very fast pace. For example, transportation. We had cycles, we had the early cars, uh, then we had improved cars, and then we had aeroplanes, we had space shuttles. We have seen technology helping in improving uh, the modes of transportation like anything at a very fast pace. The technology change has had great economic impact on industrial and social growth. All of you would agree to that. It was the entire uh, progress of humanity, of countries, of nations, of organizations has uh, been riding the back of technology. Technology has in fact revolutionized the life as well as quality of life through product development. Now, what is the ultimate effect? What is the ultimate goal of any technology? Ultimate goal of any technologies is to create a product or a service. And what is it used for? A company does it to earn profits, to earn money. So any business is formed with the ultimate aim of uh, doing business or earning money. And for that, they require, they require technology in some form or the other. So the role of technology in uh, growth of human humanity and mankind can be summarized in a few lines like this. It provides uh, sustainable competitive advantage, increases productivity, creates profits, protects from obsolescence, achieves business market fit, enhances motivation and potential of employees. It's an engine of economic growth. This is a very important statement. Technology forms the engine for economic growth for any organization, for any country. It also improves the quality of human life. Now, look at this. The technology in itself does not create wealth. It is the appropriate and effective use of such technology which creates wealth for the organization or the country as a whole. Wealth is created on the basis of technology, production, and smart. All easily understood, basic English. I hope uh, we're on the same page. That brings us to the technology S-curve. I'll just give a basic introduction into the technology curve because uh, I believe you have a full session on technology curves with uh, uh, Professor Tarim Mahindra, with whom you had a session today in the morning. Every technology for that matter, it follows a curve known as the technology S curve, which looks like this, which looks like this. It basically starts off with the R&D phase, uh, followed by the introduction of the technology or the product. Then it follows the growth phase, it matures, and finally it declines. So any, whenever some, uh, any organization or any university wants to start off or a, start, or a startup company wants to bring a new technology, the first thing that it does is, it uh, starts off with the R&D. So what typically happens is that initially the performance of the new technology is poor, improves slowly because people are not yet aware of what the technology is. So as it starts increasing and it experiences growth and uh, this performance starts to pick up. Sorry, I think. Yeah. Uh, so after it has grown rapidly, we it uh, attains a kind of a plateau. This is where it's called the technology has matured. Eventually, a performance ceiling is reached and improvement stalls. So after this plateau, what happens? There is no further improvement in technology. From here, uh, it's very short here, you can't see, but from here comes the dip. It goes like this. Any company, if it wants to sustain its market or adapt to changes, has to enhance from this point and bring in a new technology. And if it doesn't, this chasm or gap will eat up the company. Something which happened to companies like uh, Beltec, Dynara, or for that matter, Kodak, Pan Am, 
companies which didn't survive because even for that matter nokia nokia was a dominant player in the early 2000s we all know we all use nokia phones and uh, i still use one today it's a different thing uh, but what happened to nokia it was late it didn't say no but it was late in embracing touch screen technology so it lost out its market to apple to uh, samsung and uh, the chinese clans so any company when it reaches this decline stage this is the one this is the time when the next wave of technology has to be brought in which has to be an improvement so that the company survives and the company can sustain typical example is uh, of how technology evolved over the stages is our own mobile phone technology i'll just uh, tell you in short you remember the first call the first mobile call was made by uh, the person the ceo of motorola way back in 1973 this was the first handheld mobile phone chunky looking set very robust it must have been this gave way to uh, the second generation of uh, mobile technology wherein we had uh, these mobile phones uh, these are the gsm standards it started there, i think somewhere in finland by a company known as radio linja then started the third uh, generation of mobile phones uh, the 3g we were also used to in early 2000s india we were a little late in embracing this technology but this is what we saw these uh, smartphones started coming and then this gave way to the 4g phones of today we all have seen 4g happening we still have 2g and 3g in india but we are catching up for sure so 4g gave us huge amount of speed it was a generation ahead uh um, it had huge improvements in speed and performance and uh, it had an ip based mobility very high speed data was there and now we are looking forward to a 5g technology and we all know the controversies which happened many of the companies i mean one of the biggest players huawei the chinese company because of security issues many countries including india have banned it and uh, let's see how we progress with this next level of mobile technology so if you see this was the entire technology curve so at every stage when a technology reached its maturity point say 1g so we had an upgraded technology called 2g when 2g more or less matured we had 3g 3g gave way to 4g and we are uh, almost on the cusp of a new revolution that will be 5g which hopefully we should see in the next year now this is a technology life cycle versus an adoption curve i'll not go much into detail what it typically does it it plots the growth of the s curve with an adoption curve adoption is you make a technology you make a product but what's the use if it is not adopted well it doesn't diffuse well any technology or any product needs to undergo this process of diffusion that is it must reach the last person it is meant to today you have even the person in a small village in india you will find him with uh, maybe a smartphone many of them in fact so what is that that is the depth to which technology has penetrated so these are the adoption curve uh, the one here and uh, there are various uh, terms which we use like stage 1 is called innovators then we have early adopters early majority late majority and laggards laggards uh, we'll have a session on this in the technology s curve session wherein uh, mahendra sir will be taking about that, speaking to you about this so this brings us to what are the emerging technologies well almost all of you are aware i will just brush through blockchain artificial intelligence well uh, they say data is a new oil and uh, artificial intelligence or ai is the new currency there are uh, people who say this then there is big data then there is the internet of things the virtual reality and augmented reality 3d printing robotics cloud computing many of there are already here but uh they're still emerging there's still improvements in being made and we are going to a completely different level of technology as i said industry 4.0 or 4.0 embraces all this together wherein it leads to a cyber physical or interconnected world so this is a mckinsey report uh, published uh, a little old somewhere in 2015 16 it says uh, it speaks of the estimated potential economic impact of technologies from uh very sized applications in 2020 it studies certain patterns and says what will happen in 2025 this includes consumer surpluses also if you see the majority of uh, technology which will have an impact uh of the future in future include mobile internet automation 
knowledge of work, Internet of Things, cloud technology, advanced robotics, uh, next generation genomics, energy storage, 3D printing, advanced materials, advanced oil and gas exploration and recovery, and renewable energy. And amongst this, which is at the top, it's almost 3.7 to 10.8, almost close to 11%, or sorry, 11 trillion dollars of projected uh, economic impact uh, will be because of mobile, because of the improvement of mobile internet, followed by automation of office work and IOTs. Uh, now, this is an interesting slide. It says, this is typically uh, related to the adoption of technology. It says, it maybe a little blurred, but uh, you can still see it. Speaks of the number of years it took for each product to gain 50 million users. It is 5 crore users. 5 crore is a small number when you consider India, but uh, with respect to technology, it's a big number. So it took 68 years for the aeroplane or the airlines to penetrate uh, 50 million users. Automobiles took 62 years. Telephone took 50 years. Electricity, 46. Credit cards took 28 years. Television took 22. Uh, ATMs took 18 years, computers took 14, cell phones 12, internet 7, iPods 4, YouTube 4, Facebook 3, Twitter 2, and Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go is the game which you all know. It just took around 19 days to have uh, 50 million subscribers to the game. Having seen what technology and the emerging technologies are, let us come to this slide. I'm sure. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, continue. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, someone just uh, put a message saying you are muted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know this thing called wanna cry. There is this person holding his head. I'm sure many of you will be remembering way back in 2017 when more than uh, three million computers using Windows were hit by this ransomware called wanna cry. Finally, we were able to overcome, but people had to shell out a lot of money. Companies, organizations, governments had to shell out lots of money. So what was WannaCry? Ransomware, of course it was. That is a technical term. But what was WannaCry as a whole? In the broader scheme of things, WannaCry was a risk. A risk of over-dependency on technology. Is, wasn't it? Let us see. So that brings us to our topic, what is risk? Here I have given a little animated uh, photo which shows two cars colliding head on. So the risk was a collision. Collision. What were the causal factors? Maybe one of the, one of the drivers was looking back uh, through the rear view mirrors, not concentrating on the road. The other one was on his mobile phone. Many of us do that. Someone was breaking hard. People. Some other factors could be people not wearing seat belts. I hope all of you wear seat belts and wear helmets. We all are responsible citizens. Please do that. And what was the effect? Loss of time, vestige of time, because two cars colliding with each other, injuries to some people, and uh, loss of money. So the risk primarily has a causal factor or factors, and its effect is some kind of a damage which can be huge on health, on pocket, on economy, on anything, you can say. So what is a risk? A little definition, a risk is nothing but an uncertain future event or condition, which, if it happens, affects the mission objectives. Typical textbook definition, every company or every organization has a goal or a mission. And if it doesn't circumvent or doesn't uh, face the risk and mitigate the effects of risk, a risk may cause uncertainties and can affect it in a negative way. So the ultimate aim of uh, looking at risk management is to reduce the impact of negative risks. Negative risks are the one which causes damage. And positive risks are the ones which are called opportunities. Well, that's a new word, positive risk. I hope you all know about it. For example, uh, early on this year, not a very good year, 2020, but then a good thing happened. Good thing in terms of market for a particular company. Reliance saw the e-tailing market and decided to jump onto the bandwagon with a new app or with a new strategy or a new company called Geomart. You all know. What were the risks? 
there were established players like Flipkart, like Amazon, Mintra, and so many other things. Well, Mintra is typically to clothes and merchandise, but Amazon and Flipkart had a huge amount of market for me. But there was a window of opportunity. It was a risk, but a positive risk. And this is precisely what Mr. Mukesh Ambani saw. And he started his company called Geomart. It's catching up. The beta version has been launched. Uh, it will settle down soon. But this is what you call a positive risk, which is in cashing on a window of opportunity. There's a wonderful saying by the famous uh, poet T.S. Eliot, and uh, quote unquote, only those who will risk too far can possibly find out how far can one go. Confused? Read again. Only those who will risk going too far can possibly find out how far one goes. So till the time you know our boundaries or you go beyond your walls, you will not be able to explore the beauties or the importance of what is outside there. Some amount of risk may be involved, but you have to take that risk if you want to progress. So what are the various types of risks? I'll be speaking, I'm speaking about corporate risk because uh, this is what concerns us today. So corporate risk typically consists of things like financial risks. Financial risk means we have fluctuations in the currency rates. Only the software companies are happy when the price of dollar goes up, which I'm sure you'll agree with me. Then there are strategic risks. I mean, changing customer preferences. It's a competitor's world, the fiercely competitive market, and the customers are spoiled for choice because of this competition. So a strategic risk is always there. There's always the risk of spoiling a brand name. I'll give you a typical example. We remember 2015 when Volkswagen, famous uh, German company, was embroiled in a uh, unfortunate uh, case wherein it had fudged its emission norms and uh, it was brought to book by the American uh, Environmental Council. It had to pay millions of dollars to get over it. But what happened? Ultimately, what happened is, of course, the company has come back again. It's too big a company. It owns uh, sister companies like Audi, Skoda, and so many other things. But it did spoil its brand name for at least one or two years. A company as renowned as Volkswagen could cheat. It was difficult to understand. And uh, the next is economic risk. Fluctuations in import-export duty, which happens because of trade barriers between countries, exchange rates, political instability which uh, many companies of the world is seeing nowadays. Then we have technological risk, which we are concerned in today's lecture. It primarily speaks of new technology failure, security threat, rapid technology, rapid changing technology. Well, uh, when we look back at the, the technology curve, if you look at this, this decline phase in itself is a major risk, because if you want to survive, you have to overcome that risk. So then there are regulatory and compliance risks. Every government has a different kind of regulatory practice. So change in tax structure, environmental laws, and labor laws, which are very relevant nowadays. Uh, you have non-compliance of contracts by buyers or suppliers, regular supply chains, and quality issues, which are operational risks. Supply chain risk became very pertinent this year. We all know because of this COVID issue, uh, because the global supply chains were adversely affected because China being the production house of the world, uh, people cast a suspicious eye on China after this Wuhan virus came into force. So what exactly is technologically ri technology risk? This is precisely what we saw in the last slide. It's the potential of, uh, for losses due to technology failures. Important word, technology failures. A technology can fail. Technology means it could be a product which is the outcome of a technology. It can fail. For example, an e-commerce website crashing result, results in loss of revenue. Uh, we have seen cases of uh, IRC, IRCTC website or the Air India website getting hanged at times. I'm sure you must have seen that while booking tickets because of too much of traffic. So that means the company or the software or the website is not able to handle. So this is a technology challenge. Second, a technology project goes over budget and fails to meet goals set out in its business case. Uh, people who have read about China, there is this uh, uh, railway line, high-speed railway line uh, called, uh, forgetting the name of the company. Yeah, it was called, uh, it was from Beijing to Shanghai. It was supposed to cut down uh, the travel time to under three hours. 
and china invest invested close to uh, 6 billion us dollars but there were no takers because the tickets were so high the company the government of china had heavily invested so it had gone over budget because it wanted to make a statement but economic viability is of course under question third thing is the security incident resulting in theft or customer data resulting in legal liability reputational damage and compliance issues you all know we read newspapers every day hacking phishing what not is happening everywhere in the world if you use upi if you use the internet if you use mobile phone you are susceptible to some form of eavesdropping or some form of data theft or some form of phishing or hacking you remember that infamous incidents uh, wherein one of the bank employees i'll not name it's a very big indian bank was supposedly the custodian custodian of uh, the customer's data leaked it leaked it to some companies or to some other uh, doubtful websites so that people's individual uh, details like names properties passwords were leaked so this can happen by insiders as well as outsiders it's a very scary thing but you must be aware of it then there is a trading uh, algorithm which makes a series of illogical trades that results in losses people who are used to the share markets can understand this better so the next question is is despite all these risks is technology risk worth taking well certainly is uh, there was this uh, survey which was carried out by this American company called KPMG. It shows uh, of all the people who were questioned or interviewed, 68% said yes, it is an opportunity. But a certain percent said uh, industry leaders uh, view technology as a risk to be min minimized. But you see the majority, majority, 68% said yes, it is an opportunity which must be leveraged. And the balance, I guess, had no answer or no did not answer well. That's why it's only 68 and 13. So that leaves out the balance 19%. So if you plot the value or risk of a technology or a product associated with the technology with the basic impact of, uh, against time, we get a graph like this. This is somewhat akin to the S curve. S curve was somewhere we ended. Here, if we extend it like this, this is. If you see initially, this is low to high. And as this is time increasing on the x axis. So, as the increasing, as the technology progresses and matures, the business value increases till the time it reaches this highest point and it starts growing down till it declines finally. But what about the risk? I'm sure all of you are aware of that classical uh, bathtub curve, which happens with every product during its launch. Whenever a new product is launched, initially it takes some, some time to settle down. Once it has settled down, it performs well. So it is this risk curve is something akin to the bathtub curve. So initially during R&D, when there are suspicions about whether the technology will prove to be effective or not, uh, the risk is very high, but subsequently it falls, it reaches a nadir somewhere over here. But then as it ages, the risks increase again. So there is a risk to value gap which increases as the technology goes to the decline phase and goes towards obsolescence. There is uh, another slide uh, which speaks of this is uh, this was an, uh, a kind of a questionnaire or a, this one conducted by an European country uh, European uh, organization called uh, study group called ACE European Group. It generally studied a few countries in Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and it tried to find out what were the main risks which are causing concerns to industry uh, headonkos in these three regions of Europe. So if you can see, the technology had 43%, which was at the top of the list. That means technology risks and technological risk concerns were the ones which were perturbing or causing concerns to most of the industries. This was followed by uh, supply chain and regulatory and compliance. And there were other things, as you can read from this. Slide. Now, technology can be incremental or disruptive. Incremental means it progresses in a slow, steady pace. Disruptive means you take rapid leaps and bounds. Uh, for example, uh, you all of you must be knowing about this company called 3M. We use, uh, I mean, uh, the lockdown period must have introduced to the scotch bright in the kitchen. I know many of you must have. Yeah. This was a product which was brought in by the 3M company. 
And uh, Freem is one of the world's most innovative companies. The other ones, a lot of them are there, IBM, Apple, Samsung, but 3VM has a very unique culture. In fact, uh, they were also the ones who found out the post-it stamps. You don't know those post-it stamps, these yellow colored stamps, which you stick it uh, to take down a note. So there was this uh, interesting story in it. There was this chemist who was working with uh, uh, 3M. He was working on something, but he suddenly found that he can use a piece of paper with some kind of an adhesive glue, and it can stick onto, uh, say, a, a, a wall or a, a polished surface or a computer screen or something. He was so overjoyed, he took it, he just ran with it and took it to the CEO of the company. Uh, the CEO, they have a very open culture in 3M. The CEO was having, having his lunch. He was so overjoyed with a small chemist who literally walked into his office. He was so overjoyed with this invention. He said, I want to give you a gift or an award, but unfortunately I'm having lunch and all that I have is this banana. <laughs> he gave the banana as a reward. But interestingly, 3M has this golden banana award, which it gives to his employees for the most innovative thing they have found. This, that's the history of the Golden Banana Award. If you, it's an interesting read. You must read, uh, go through the 3M website. And then there are disruptive technologies. Companies like Apple, like Samsung, it always wants to leapfrog. We had the typewriter, uh, which leapfrogged. And uh, we had the computers, the PCs, and now we're still going ahead. Uh, remember way back, way back in the early 2000s, we had this new technology with a lot of promise. Uh, it was supposed to be disruptive called the Blu-ray. For a few years, people thought it is the ultimate definition of quality, of sound, and uh, but the cost was so high, uh, the sales were a little, the cost was a little prohibitive. But what has happened with uh, the cloud, the internet, and other facilities coming, Blu-ray is nowhere there. So it's again a pitfall of technology. So uh, see, it was what happened to Yahoo. You remember Yahoo? I've been speaking of Yahoo. 1996, the IPO. Uh, it became one of the most sought after companies in the US. Somewhere in the 2000, just before the dot com burst, price had reached somewhere around $118.75. But back in 2017, I guess, 16, 17, Yahoo was finally sold off because uh, its share prices had fallen so much that it couldn't uh, sustain growth. So it had to be sold off to someone. Even our own Savir Bhatia owned uh, uh, Hotmail, also happened something like this. Uh, this is just a list of various, uh, it's called a risk preference framework, just for information, the various categories wherein you can place uh, risks with reference to emerging and disruptive technologies. Uh, it can be a product family or a brand positioning risk, a product technologically, a product technology risk, a manufacturing technology risk. You may have an emerging technology with which you want to manufacture a product, maybe a very high end uh, fuel cell uh, powered car but your technology or the infrastructure for manufacturing the car is not up to date. So that could pose a risk to the company who's trying to do that. There could be IPR risks, intellectual property, we all know are, this is happening very much, data theft, uh, I mean, identity theft, IP theft. Supply chain sourcing risk, as I spoke in the last slide, the COVID-19 uh, COVID scenario has uh, disrupted global supply chains. Then there is a consumer acceptance and marketing risks. Trade customer risks, cost competitor risks, commercial viability risk, organization and project management risks, external risks, screening and appraisal risks. I mean, they're very simple English. I'm sure the word itself would tell everyone what is it. Uh, if you thought technology risks are only meant for high end technology based companies, software companies, then we are all mistaken. Technology risks happen to everything, including banks, retail outlets, anywhere and everywhere. So what are the types of technology risks we can see in uh, a typically bank which uses IT as its backbone? So we can have an information and cybersecurity risks, very relevant because any leakage of confidential data or internal data, fraudulent transactions, which happen nowadays, which is very rampant, please do not share your ATM pins and details with others because the world is full of hackers and they're all ready to just pounce upon you to eat them. Hacktivism, hacktivism is what? It's uh, unfortunately hacking as an activism. Unfortunately, this has been picking up, but you must save yourself and your organization from it. Then there are resilience and 
uh, resilience and disaster recovery, recovery, vendor and third party management, project and change management, architecture development and testing. Uh, someone speaking something? Okay, we have data quality and governance and IT compliance issues. IT compliance means we all know non compliance of IT systems and process with regulations. But that brings us to risk management, a very important topic. Risk management, as a word itself, is uh, self understood. It is how do you manage the risk in, especially in tech companies? It's a very logical process. Even uh, in your homes, while you undertake a mission, suppose today, uh, you are working in a company, you are a top notch uh, manager in say a company and uh, you're supposed to go to a different city today in the evening, but your daily schedule has taken so much of time that you have to rush to the airport to catch a flight or else you'll miss it. And to top it all, it's been raining incessantly, the roads are slippery. So mentally you calculate or you can picture what are the risk involved. First is if I get delayed in my meetings, I'll miss the flight, which I have to take for going to say Delhi. Second, if I try to drive first, or I ask, I ask my office cabby driver to drive me very first because of bad weather, inclement weather, might end up in an uh, end up in an accident, which could be detrimental to my health and cost everywhere. So, for risk management, you need to identify. First thing is identifying. It's a very logical process. I just put it in some form of soft English, but it is. Even if you don't study this or don't read this, you can mentally make up how you should go about managing the risk. Of course, bigger companies use, use customized uh, uh, solutions and there are third party solutions, third party companies which provide you with risk management software, companies like uh, Deloitte, companies like KPMG, and there's a plethora of other companies which provides you with uh, risk management solutions. So this is followed by the coordinated and economical application of uh, Resources. Why economic and why coordinated? Because resources, be it at your home or in your organization, your college, your universities, or your country, resources will always be uh, restricted. I mean, there will be a scarcity of resources somewhere or the other. We are not speaking of Western countries. So if you have to overcome a risk or tackle a risk, you must plan it wisely. So the ultimate aim is to minimize, monitor, and control the probability and or impact of uh, unfortunate events. This should be the goal of risk management and to maximize the realization of profits. So what are the benefits? Benefits of risk management are fewer surprises for you or your company, effective use of resources, as we spoke earlier, and this also helps in reassuring stakeholders. What is reassuring stakeholders? Now you bring in a technology or a product or service which writes on a technology and your stakeholders. Uh, this could be the government, this could be the customers who you sell to. They may be worried, he, uh, can I really believe this on this uh, product or this service? They have, now once they know key, you have a very uh, sound system. So they'll be pretty assured, ki, okay, maybe I can believe on this company or this organization and I can blindly go ahead. One of those many, of models available for risk management, which says uh, measure, assess, evaluate, and manage. It's the same thing. You identify, you assess. Uh, assess means uh, how much is it going to impact you. You evaluate the effects and how you manage. It's just shown in the form of a pictorial form uh, for risk management. So it starts off with, in, again, going in a flow diagram uh, process. Starts off with risk identification, followed by assessment, responding to risks, monitoring and evaluating risks, and I trade for continuous improvement. It is not key, you have a risk and you have managed it for one time. It's like you have to keep on improving. The risk parameters increase every day. What is a technological risk for today may give way to a new, different, more higher amount of risk tomorrow. So you have to evolve at every stage, something like what we do in quality, something you all know the world called Kaizen, change for good. So there is incremental improvement every day that is happening. So what does it do? It basically tackles the risk management, tackles the processes the and the methodologies. You use various kinds of tools. Lots of tools are available, many courts commercially uh, off the shelf kind of tools. Plus you can devise your basic tools to 
tackle emergencies or risks and they are meant for targeted end users and these uh, tools tell you when to use or how to use it and it ultimately helps in advantages some has advantages some may not be of advantages to you advantages to you so what does a risk identification do what does a risk identification do uh, Risk identification will consist of time, cost, resources, environmental, scope, and communication. Well, if you can read, these are just various things on which you need to, uh, parameters on which you need to, uh, uh, which will help you in identification of risk. Uh, time is whether when you're working on a project, a technology-based project, whether is, there is a schedule overrun or a, a cost or schedule overrun or a task uh, omitted from the schedule or a opportunity to compress schedule, then there is, a cost or a budget exceeded and uh, unanticipated expenditure or a resource risk. A team is under resourced, material shortage, machinery unavailable, industrial action, skill gaps. There could be industrial risks which you need to identify. Sorry, environmental risks which you need to identify. Environmental risks, very pertinent. Bad weather resulting in rework. There's a, there's a cyclone hitting. Uh, there's an adverse, adverse environmental uh, effect which can affect everyone. And uh, there's a weather delay, which can delay uh, the progress of the technology or environmental approvals are not complied with. Again, that could be a major risk. Then there is a scope risk, scope creep. Those, uh, all of you, those who know about project management people, especially in the software or other industries do. Creep comes in if you are not sticking. It is a very pertinent risk. Then the scope poorly defined. And uh, the project changes poorly managed. And finally, the communication. Communication is an important part, which can lead to a risk. Poor, you're not communicating well with, uh, well with other stakeholders. Stakeholders are dissatisfied. This can lead to a risk in future. So how do you assess the risk? This is a very basic uh, slide which I have shown, a basic tool which I have shown. You plot the likelihood of a risk or an unfortunate uh, event happening on the y-axis versus uh, the impact, the effect of the impact on the x-axis, say. So we have plotted it from low to high to low for likelihood and uh, for the impact from, again, high to low. It's very logical. So we can have a risk whose uh, likelihood is high and likelihood of impact is high and the impact uh, effect will also be high. For example, in the example uh, I gave earlier, you have to rush to the airport to catch a flight. So to catch a flight, you are now overspeeding. So the likelihood of an accident is high and the impact, if it happens, what is the magnitude of impact? In case you're involved in an accident, you could be injured severely, something like this. And then the next is uh, likelihood is high, but the impact uh, will be low. That is, you may not have, you may have a likelihood of high, but its impact will not really affect you much. Uh, you're sitting in a home, uh, you're sitting in your office, and there's a little uh, earthquake which has happened. Maybe on the Richter scale, it shows a two pointer or a three pointer. It doesn't really affect you. You know it is a risk, it is a potential risk, but it will not stop you from working. Then, then there is a likelihood is low, but the impact will be high. Today, you want to make a factory on the catchment area of a dam, knowing well it is a safe, but then there is a risk in future, okay, tomorrow, or maybe in a decade or so, if the dam breaks, your entire factory will be washed off. But you are taking this calculated risk, despite having the impact. <laughs> and last but not the least, uh, low likelihood and low impact. Well, it is very easily understood. So what do we do for Risk mitigation, again, very logical. You can use your own theories. You can use your own demag, your own malu. But one of those many uh, systems which are available in the market or in the industry is ARAT, as we call it. So what is ARAT? First is avoid a risk. Second is reduce a risk. Accept, because you know a risk is about to happen and uh, you can't get over it. And or transfer a risk. Let us see this. What are these? What is risk avoidance? Avoidance is if there is a possibility, refuse to accept the risk. The best way. Well, there's a famous saying uh, amongst sailors. They say a ship in harbor is safe. But then, is it what the ships are meant for? 
No, a ship has to sail. It will encounter bad weather. So you cannot just avoid risk. It's very easy to say, okay, a ship will not sail. So we have avoided no accidents, no bad weather. We're all safe and sound, but then we'll not progress. The world, world will come to a stop if you avoid risks. So one way, probably a very thumb rule kind of a thing is you refuse to accept risk, usually achieved by the use of exemption clauses. Yeah, there are certain methods. You use exemption clauses in the contract. Suppose you're working with a firm so that uh, by the end of which you'll not accept a certain part of the project, which you know is bound to fail. I mean, unrealistic timelines or unrealistic costs could be uh, something like that. Then there is risk retention. Now, what is risk retention? Risk may be retained. Uh, companies retain means you keep it with you, but it is usually accompanied by some contingency budget or a mitigation measure. Contingency budget means you have a budget specifically meant for mitigating risks for many reasons. For example, this budget could be in the form of uh, premiums, which you give to insurance companies, expectations of rewards, or you make your company such that it is able to absorb the risk impacts. I mean, you see what has happened to most of the countries. We have faced losses because of uh, the downturn of the economy, which is happening because of uh, the COVID situation. I'm sure they're all bouncing back. But good, good companies like Tata, good companies like ITC, I'm sure many others, I mean, you know more than me about the number of companies, they will bounce back. Because these companies are made on such good fundamentals. The other way I was speaking to one of my friends, uh, they are made on such good fundamentals that they will ultimately rebound back. So they can retain certain amount of risk, even the risk is even if the risk is say a COVID dollar risk. Then there is this thing called risk transfer or risk allocation. This is some risk which we all do in our uh, everyday life. Herein we transfer part of the risk to another party. This is important. Transferring a risk to another party by insurance. Why I said we all do is we all buy health insurance. We all buy uh, life insurance. Why? What, what is insurance? We are basically paying a company a premium, the insurance company a premium. And what the company is done, it is pooling in the risks by taking premiums of various different uh, people. So even a company can get certain parts of it or uh, a lot of insurance done so that it has transferred the risk onto some insurance company. It can also have partners and other ways having partners to share the risk. But now there is an interesting uh, example of this. We all pay taxes to the government, GST, uh, VAT, and so, so many different kinds of taxes we pay. So one thing is why do we pay taxes? Because the government needs those firms, uh, those funds for making new roads, for making new infrastructure, for bringing in development to the country. But at the same time, here, the government is also giving you partners to share the risk. Just think of it. What is the police doing? What is the military doing? What are the hospitals doing? They are basically partnering your risk. You have a health problem. You go to a government doctor. He's sharing your risk. He's trying to cure you. You have a law and order problem. The police comes and helps you. You have a country to country problem. The military jumps in. So basically, you are paying some amount of money to share the risk. Then there are uh, Subcontracting, this is another available. I mean, I've just given an example of Lee and Fung. People who have studied uh, uh, supply chain management will know this is one of the best examples uh, for a 4PL company. 4PL is uh, 3PL and 4PL are logistics, uh, uh, logistics service providers. We also have a lot of them, Agarwals and uh, many things, other companies in India which provide you 3PL and 4PL services. They're, just not, they're not just involved in transporting your uh, goods from maybe the raw material source to the factory, but they take care of a lot of things like indenting, uh, customer surveys. So Li Feng is a beautiful example. I mean, I would uh, request whenever in your free time, you can Google how Li Feng, of course, the company nowadays is facing a little bit of a financial problem, but this is a company to which many big textile companies, including companies like Zara, m &S, had been outsourcing uh, the textile requirements too. And this company manages all the textile requirements, textile being the uh, biggest seller for this company. Then uh, there is some remark on risk transfer. Risk transfer is transferring risk to other parties, as I said, with certain amount of cost, that is the risk premium. And transferring risk does not necessarily reduce the overall risk, but understood it doesn't reduce the risk. It is only 
that you are sharing it and the risk exposure is evenly distributed to some other parties. And last but not the least, risk mitigation. After have you done everything? So what do you do? You try to mitigate your risk. Mitigate is you try to reduce the impact or the negative impact on the risk on you. So what do you do in risk uh, mitigation? What you do is basically you reduce the likelihood and or impacts of the risk. How do you do it? You may redesign the project. You may share the risk uh, by using different types of contract. There are lots of examples, uh, but uh, let us move ahead. Uh, you may educate your stakeholders, train them well, train your employees. Physically protect, uh, physical protection and safety measures could be another risk mitigation effort. Contingency budget, budget and reserves, as we saw in the insurance case, and so on. There are lots of ways in which you can uh, mitigate your uh, risks. So this is a framework for classifying risk. And just to give you an example, uh, something this something known as technology readiness levels. You have a session the day after tomorrow. So Captain uh, Garud is taking this. This is on TRL. So uh, technology companies, governments, companies like DRDO, ISRO, or uh, American company like uh, sorry, American uh, defense companies like uh, Boeing, or for that matter, the federal agency like DARPA, when they make a technology. A technology, they categorize it in the form of technology readiness levels. Means you make a company today, for example, I'll take the example of uh, LCA. We all know about the LCA Tejas project. A lot of you know uh, very well, but how is it? It's a wonderful example of TRLs. When they started the R&D, DRDO, so they were at a technology key, uh, TRL level of one. One is the basic stage wherein you conceptualize a project. And then you start building up, building up on your technologies, Till you start uh, getting everything right, your tests done, and finally, finally you end up with a prototype of the project. So finally, we had uh, the LCA Tejas aircraft. It was proven. So that when you come to this stage, you, this is called as a TRL level of nine. Uh, I'll not go, get into details because why I'm saying this because this TRL level is associated with some amount of risk. This you can also relate to your technology S curve. So when you are at a, at a TRL level of one. So the risks are very high because you do not know you are investing a lot of money in a project. Say today, Apple wants to make, a, uh, I'll give an example. I recently read an article which said, as on date, Apple has employed, uh, Apple is one of the most uh, technological advanced companies. Uh, you all will agree with me. Has employed close to 1200 high-end engineers. High-end means they're very competent engineers who are just working on improving that camera, which uh, Apple has in the iPhone. And what is the basic idea? They want to take on, or they want to uh, ensure that the camera takes photographs the way a digital SLR, a professional digital SLR camera does. SLR camera, you all know, single lens reflex, which professionals use. They use a lot of optical instruments and a lot of big time sensors. So Apple is investing heavily into software so that with the software, they can achieve the same result which a hardware of a, a uh, digital SLR will achieve. So as the technology matures and it is proven, the risks start reducing. So we have to keep in mind that as technology is mature, that is project ages, obsolescence and leapfrogging risk is introduced. Uh, leapfrogging, as I said earlier, once technology re uh, reduces or goes through a decline phase, uh, you must leapfrog to the next. Whereas there is a different school of thought, which I must say, uh, I mean, all of you must have uh, uh, heard about or must be following this famous, uh, our famous scientist, Dr. Raghunath Mashal, uh, Mashalkar. He's a, he's a luminary. He's been head of CSIR, uh, CSIR and presently he's on the uh, innovation councils of many, many countries, including advisories to the prime minister and so on. You must see his videos on uh, YouTube. Mashal, Dr. Mashalkar says, Technology, a leapfrogging means it comes from the word, the way a frog jumps. Of course, it jumps a lot of steps. He says leapfrogging is, is basically comes from uh, a tendency of the frog when it is scared. So it is running away from its predators. But that is not what we want in India today. Instead, we must pole vault. Pole vault means you have a, you must have technologies in which you can, you can actually jump over greater heights and reach higher technological levels. Read about Dr. Mashal, uh, Mashalkar and uh, see his videos on YouTube. They are wonderful. They are eye-openers, I must say. 
So what kind of risk management tools do you use? Well, there are many, many tools, customized tools, which are made by companies like Deloitte, KPMG, and so many other kind of companies which provide customized tools. But here, why I'm showing this, this is just to show you some easy tools which you use in your everyday life, in your everyday workplace. Some of them are a SWOT analysis. What is SWOT analysis? I'll cover in the next slide. I'll not cover all of them. I'll just be throwing light on a few of them. Second is, what is the root cause analysis? The second is the root cause analysis, which uh, gets to the main reason of the risk. Well, today uh, you have fever. That is what? Fever is the symptom. But is it the real cause why your body is uh, warm or is heated? No, the real cause could be an underlying coronavirus, or it could be a dengue, or it could be a malaria. So what RCA does is, root cause analysis does is, it tries to go to the root, it tries to find out, what is the root of the problem and eliminate it there so that it doesn't happen further. It also uh, is used after accidents or problems have taken place. It can be used both ways. Brainstorming with your team and experts. Brainstorming you all do in your offices, you all do in your uh, classrooms. You take a topic, you ask everyone from top to bottom, no hierarchy involved. Even the uh, lowest person in the hierarchy can come up with a wonderful, wonderful solution, out of the box solution. And you must listen to it. You must uh, listen to the solutions being provided so that the risk can be mitigated well ahead of time. Then there are risk assessment templates uh, for IT works for all projects. So people who are involved in software IT projects, they must be knowing much more about it. There are certain kinds of many customized templates made by various uh, software companies also. Then there is this risk register. A register we all use, it's a copy kind of a thing, but instead of writing by hand, of course, you can always write by hand. It is a digital kind of a register. When in, you note down, suppose you are embarking on a project uh, which is technologically intensive, what all kinds of risks will you encounter? And what are the chances of the risk occurring so you can prioritize them? Uh, then you have the probability and impact register. You remember uh, the last two, last slide we saw? Uh, this is nothing but a probability versus impact matrix kind of a thing. This is a basic example of that. Yeah. Uh, then we have risk quality data assessment, which makes sure our information or the risk is uh, accurate. We have FMEA or failure mode uh, effects analysis. Or many of you uh, who have studied quality, who have studied supply chains, people of or into management, into industrial engineering, must have used uh, FMEA tools, DFMEA, process FMEA, and so on. You have another tool called AHP, analytic uh, hierarchy uh, progress. You have risk radars, and there are numerous other tools. These are just to name a few. So what is a SWOT analysis? Uh, as the name suggests, S stands for strength, is what you do well, what is your strength? I'm good at something. That is my core competency. That is my strength. You, what is your weakness? W stands for weakness. Where do you need to improve? What is, what are the opportunities? That is, what are your goals? And what are the obstacles you're likely to face? And so these are the threats which you are likely to encounter when you go ahead. Uh, I have given a figure of Amazon. It's uh, someone conducted a SWOT analysis on Amazon. You know, all, we all use Amazon for delivery of, uh, it's an e-retailing company, it's a giant. The strengths include its brand. It's a brand in itself. It is one of the two biggest or two, three biggest uh, retail companies, e-retail or retail companies in the world. The other being, uh, which is the other one? Walmart. Yeah. India. In India, we do have uh, a lot of companies, but uh, many of them follow. Like DMART follows the Walmart example. Uh, Flipkart has followed the Amazon example. Of course, Flipkart is now part owned by uh, Walmart. So the strength includes its brand strength. The brand is the third most global brand. The financial performance, which is growing, ever growing. Uh, the synergies, the customer experiences. Seamless experience, you order something today, tomorrow you are a customer, is a prime member, it gets delivered to you without having to go out. Then there is a, it forms uh, the cost leadership. It commands superior buying power. I mean, it provides one of the lowest costs for any products or services, not services, products rather. Then it's a range of, Merchants have got it uses technology. They use a software called AWS, Amazon Web Service. I mean, uh, you must be knowing about that. It's a wonderful, wonderful way. It's a beautiful software which they use to control this entire uh, theater of activities, if I can say that. 
and it's got a superior logistics and distribution system uh, when it compares with the global com uh, capabilities. Data cases include low margins, of course, when you give, uh, but economies of scale makes up for it. You have uh, Asia and uh, China, which are developing your failures, experiments, which the company is still improving. Employment treatment some years ago was, was an issue, but the company has overcome. Uh, the physical stores, but it does us less. Sustainability, Amazon has a poor track record of moving to sustainable solutions. Well, the company is moving forward. Opportunities, developing markets like India, Mideast, uh, Southeast Asia, it's improving by leaps and rounds. Expansion of physical stores, it is increasing uh, its distribution centers across the country, in India, in other parts of the world also. It's got hardware partnerships with uh, incorporating uh, artificial intelligence and voice recognition. In fact, um, if I know correctly, CTS is a company which is the support, which provides support for the cognizant technologies, provides support for its AWS system. Then there are new markets for healthcare, in which the company, it's an opportunity company needs to uh, go forth. Threats are competitors. We have Flipkart, we have so many other companies and Geo coming in and we recently saw Tata is likely to launch its own uh, e-telling platform in India. Then in Asia and China, there are several other factors which can affect trade. Some of them be uh, uh, trade restrictions, trade barriers, merchants and platforms when 58% uh, of sales come from merchants. In fact, the, this percentage is increasing. Then there are government regulations. Every country has a different set of regulations and because of uh, its regulatory bodies, trade practices, companies like Amazon and Flipkart do face problems at times. Next is an FMEA. It's a subject in itself. I'll try to uh, take you through within one or two slides. It's a beautiful tool. It's called a failure mode effects analysis. What does it do? It is an uh, analytical technique in which it combines uh, technology and experience, experience of the people who are working in the uh, organization. And why is it used for? It helps in identifying a foreseeable, listen, uh, see this word, it's a foreseeable failure modes of a product, or maybe a technology or a process and plan for its elimination. So basically what you do, it is a before the event action. So when you try to make a technology or bring a technology to the market, you work on it, you find what are the failure modes. So these are the possible places where this thing can fail. So using your experience, using certain technological things, using, I'll show you later, uh, you plan out these are the possible uh, risky areas. And so I must uh, attack the risky areas before it actually affects my business. So it uses occurrence and detection probability uh, criteria in conjunction with severity criteria to develop risk prioritization numbers. If you go through, these are certain things which they use in the FMEA table. Uh, we develop something known as an RPN or a risk priority number based on the severity, uh, severity of the risk, the uh, occur number of times the risk is likely to uh, occur and uh, uh, the degree of impact is it's called SOD. Uh, this is when you multiply, you get something known as a RPN. Uh, this is to be conducted immediately after design phase of any technology or any product when you are planning. So once you design, you must conduct an FA FME or companies do that, organizations do that to find out what are the possible failure modes and prior to certainly prior to production. Well, these are the definitions given in a wonderful book uh, written by Westerfield and Westerfield, uh, if you're a student of supply chain, uh, so, uh, uh, quality, you must have gone through this book. It tells you in detail about this book. There are many beautiful books. So here is, uh, uh, this I have taken from the main university. They had a project called the Land Rover Project. I hope the slide is clear to you. Uh, the headings include possibility, possible effects of failures or risks, which include mobility, navigation, structural data acquisition, Root cause, see, it studies the root cause as part of FMEA also. Root cause for each of these cases, for mobility, the root cause could be a dead battery or no gas. Gas means petrol. In US, they call it gas. We call it petrol or diesel in India. A controls failure, an alternator failure, a winding harness connection. Uh, uh, then what are the potential indicators? Potential indicators for mobility could be, uh, uh, will not power the motors. If you have a dead battery, the motors will not move. If you don't have petrol or diesel in your uh, Land Rover project, uh, we saw an example of a rover which the NASA sent to Mars, uh, remember, a few years back. 
It's something like that. This university has made a Land Rover project. So in case there is no gas, uh, of course, this was supposed to run on Earth. Uh, the engines will not run. And potential cause of failure could be due to negligence when you don't have gas and you still try to switch on your uh, engine. And then there could be a control failure, which could be because of the potential indicator could be uh, motors or server failure. And this could be because of a programming error uh, and so on. So you have a root cause, a potential indicator, a potential cause for failure. This is what we uh, call as the first term in the equation is called S. Uh, this is the form and sorry, uh, potential causes. Then we have severity, which we know as S, uh, by the, which we denote by the term, uh, by the letter S. So in S out of uh, zero to 10, we give numbers. 10 is the highest amount of risk and one is the least. So what happens is, see, for everything they have plotted, they have given some numbers for severity. The dead, dead battery here has been given a number five, an alternator failure has been given a number 10. A wiring harness connection has been given uh, number eight. Well, uh, what is a wiring harness? Any car for that matter, any plane, any helicopter has a lot of wiring just to give a basic explanation running into it. For example, uh, if you open the car, you'll find a harness or a loom in which there'll be a bunch of cables through which the various electrical and electronic uh, signals are sent to and fro from one place to another. Uh, this is uh, very high, the usage of highnesses is very high in aircraft. A typical example is, uh, you know, this uh, fighter aircraft called F-18 or Super Hornet, which US is trying to sell off to India. I must have seen of reports. One plane has got close to 17 kilometers of electrical wires. The Boeing, uh, sorry, the Airbus 380, which is the world's largest plane. Unfortunately, they're closing down production soon. A beautiful piece of machinery. It had some 360 kilometers plus of wiring, intelligent wiring running at the length and breadth fore and aft of uh, the aeroplane. Uh, so, so you see, as technology increases, the signals, the signals are sent through servo motors, generated by servo motors or sensors, and passes through these wiring harnesses. So, if the wiring harness is fa faulty but natural, the risk, uh, the severity will be high. And then uh, there is the probability of occurrence, which again has been numbered. You see, they have given some number. Uh, for example, a controls failure, the severity could be very high, but probability of occurrence could be even higher. Whereas an alternative failure, the severity could be very high. So they, they've given a 10, number 10, but the probability of occurrence is just one. It's highly unlikely to occur. Detectability is D. So finally, with all this, you arrive at something known as the risk priority or the RPN. So what is risk priority? You basically multiply all the three. So if you take the first line uh, of mobility, it is five into three into one, right? Three is a 15, 15 ones are 15. So they have given a criticality factor of 15. So basically what you do, you chart out, you take out what are all the risks involved in every possible phase. And this is possible only by use of experienced people, people on the team using their collective experience, uh, using the help of technology, they bring out. So all these uh, uh, places where it is marked in pink, so you can see the numbers are pretty high, pretty high. The criticality is again on a different scale, but criticality is with respect to the risk priority number. So if the RPN is high, the criticality is little high, but naturally pretty high. So the company or the organization must be focusing on those so that a potential failure could be avoided. Uh, one of the many tools is a risk radar. Risk radar, you just need to know there are many tools, many commercial customized tools available. This is just one of them. What is a radar? Radar, you know, we have radars everywhere. It detects aeroplanes flying. It detects a lot of things. There are weather radars. It, uh, so a risk radar is a risk management database, which is used to help project managers identify, prioritize, and communicate project risks in a flexible and ready to use forms. A risk radar provides standard database functions to add and delete risk, as well as specialized functions for prioritizing and retiring project risk. Basically, again, this is how you look when you're doing a project. Many companies use a risk radar. Basically, it is a four stage thing. It moves from outside to inside. Uh, basically, when there is a likelihood of a risk, you use that particular software to observe that risk for maybe around two months, eight weeks plus or so. Then you start monitoring if the risk still persists or increases. Now you uh, specifically keep it on the watch. And finally, 
you keep it it's it's a long term process when uh, technology uh, you, companies have chief technology officers and technology officers who are specifically trained in such kind of software people who deal with technology management know this so they focus on such kind of <coughs> sorry such kind of things using various tools and one of the thing is uh, a risk radar um, AHP is another tool which you use. It's an analytical tool uh, which is developed in the 1970s, old tool, but very effective. It's a mathematical tool uh, uh, found by, it was developed by Thomas Satie in the 1970s, and uh, it was used for structured technique for organizing and analyzing complex decisions based on mathematics and psychology. And it's commonly used for project prioritization and selection. A very simple example is what I have shown it to you. Suppose you have an election and you want to choose a leader. I have given three random names, Tom, Dick, and Harry, which we always use for everyday life. I don't be a Tom, Dick, and Harry kind of a thing. So we have to choose one leader out of Tom, Dick, and Harry. So what is the goal? Goal is to choose a leader. There is some markings given 1.0, 0 0.5, for, forget that. We don't want to get into the numericals. I mean, that's again is a huge unit in itself when you study AHP. So what is the criteria of selection out of those four? Experience, education, charisma, and age. So different participants put different priority numbers for each of this. So based on that, you decide uh, who is the highest. And then you put some alternatives. Based you Overall, you do marking. This is just a one level thing. This goes into multiple levels and huge calculations. And finally, you give numbers like this. Like Tom has got a 0.358 number, and Dick has been assigned a score of 0.93. So this says key, uh, what HP does is you can choose because a certain amount of risk by this analytical techniques are produced. So it helps you in coming to uh, in choosing a project or choosing a technology so that the risks are lessened. Well, what is this? This is ISS. I'm sure all of you know, must be knowing this. The world's biggest international space station uh, owned or co-managed by NASA and uh, Russia, of course and also founded by the European Space Agency, uh, by Japan, and so many. And there are astronauts and cosmonauts which are, who are sitting even now. In fact, in the winter months, if you look towards the west, uh, if you're in Pune, you can see a big blip. ISS is visible for some few months, if I'm not wrong. So there they found this, uh, they have put a picture of that, basically a graphical kind of a diagram, in which the impact risk, impact of a space debris is very high. This is the technology at its highest. So uh, these space agencies must uh, put into factor what are the impact risks because there are so many space debris flying. I mean, uh, satellites which have lived through their useful life, they disintegrate. Then uh, countries like uh, China, countries like America, Russia, even India for that matter. Remember 2017, we conducted that anti-satellite ASAT test called Project, Project Shakti. So what happened to the satellite? It was a dead satellite, but it fragmented into pieces. So uh, ISS must take into account what is the impact uh, severity. So all those places which are in red in color, the impact is very high. The severity of risk impact is very high. Whereas all these places like the rear side or the center side, it's highly unlikely that a space debris would have would impact. So the severity of or the impact risk is low. And this is just a photo which I've given. This is what happens when a typical one centimeter debris hits a metal structure of a satellite, it can create uh, such kind of disasters. It can create a disastrous hole. This is just to give you an example of what can happen in space. And the speeds are so high. And uh, now, yeah, this is a case study. This is a video, a seven minute video. I've almost through with my time, but uh, I would request for five to 10 minutes more. And uh, before I finish, in case you're not able to hear the sound, just tell me. This is about the project Challenger. You all remember it happened in 1986 when the Challenger spacecraft had an accident. Are you able to hear it? No, sir. Okay, okay. Uh, let me see. Uh, this was a problem. Was
Sir, unable to hear you. Sir, no voice. Sir, unfortunately, you are not audible to us.
ग्रुप कैप्टन बैनर्जी सर dear participants uh, there might be some side just uh, we have to wait just wait for some time okay sir It's okay, Anirban. Can you hear up? Yes, sir. So, Banerjee sir, your mic is off. Can you switch on your mic? Not, not audible. Not audible. Yeah, Doctor Nileshwari here. Actually, uh, there might be a techno technical technological error, but the theme of the FDP program is going on very well. So <laughs> it's it, it can happen. It is a technological risk, and we have to mitigate that risk. Though we have a plan B, uh, but still all the plans are uh, it's it's working fine. No problem. Some time.
Yeah, am I audible now? Yes, sir. Positive. Okay, sir. I'll just carry on. I'm sorry. Uh, there's a little technological glitch which happened. Uh, I'll just share my slide. So basically, uh, what I was speaking of was a case study on uh, risk in high technology, the Challenger disaster. Uh, you all know of the Challenger spacecraft, which NASA tried to launch way back in uh, 2000, uh, 1986, wherein it crashed. What happened was basically, despite taking all the precautions and carrying out so much of risk management, the accident still did happen. What, what actually happened is in the entire disaster was they calculated everything. But however, uh, at a certain uh, height, uh, which was somewhere in the upper air, upper air means it could be in excess of uh, 40, 50,000 feet. It was as you know, to get an escape velocity of 11.2 kilometers per second, a rocket has to speed uh, faster than that. So what happened is that it encountered something known as a jet stream. A jet stream is kind of a wind phenomena which happens, uh, people who have studied weather, will know it happens in the upper air in certain amount of months wherein the speeds it's a very narrow band in the upper air the speeds of wind is very high so what airline pilot typically they would like to ride on the wave so that the time to destination is reduced and they can save on fuel but the wind speeds were so high it was in excess of 300 kilometers per hour so it shook uh, the entire spacecraft to a certain angle or a certain degree because of which its thrusters malfunctioned now it malfunctioned. Ultimately, what had happened? It, its hydrogen tank got punctured. Once it got punctured, it became a live bomb. And then there was an oxygen tank on top, and the disaster occurred uh, within 68 minutes. So, risk management. Why I am telling you this is that uh, this is just to show you how important risk management is. You, I can't think of any more uh, specific risk management techniques been applied anything higher than a space shuttle launch. But despite that, technology still poses challenge. It can still over, overwhelm you where you don't uh, expect it to do. So the idea is to stay careful, plan your events in such a way that you account for whatever is best possible so that risk can be mitigated before it affects you uh, negatively. So I have almost finished. Uh, as I spoke earlier, technology is the basis for economic growth. It comes with risks, as we have seen in the case study. Organizations embracing emerging technology have to basically, uh, companies, they have to plan adequate amount of risk management into their work. And organizations must uh, plan risk, man, uh, risk mitigation plans accordingly. So before I end, again, a quick glimpse at what all you should do to reduce or minimize technological risk. One quick glimpse, identify key risk measures, uh, the risk probabilities and impact, analyze security threats, analyze the risk of hardware software failure, analyze outsourcing risks, identify control technology, measure impact, rank potential risk, and specify desired outcomes. Technology, you can't live without uh, Technology, it is used in everyday life. So all you need to do is basically know what are the risks involved and plan accordingly. It could be for your office or your organization. Uh, it could be in the form of specific teams or outsource teams, which does this for your home. Of course you do this, but you must plan risk mitigation factors effectively into it. I have finished, I have exceeded by I think 15 minutes five minutes technology eight of my presentation, but I hope uh, you, 